Today I want to share with you a no-need soaked flour bread recipe. Now if you like to bake with whole wheat, but you also want to be able to deactivate some of the phytic acid, but you don't want to make a sourdough starter and then make sourdough bread, this soaked flour recipe is for you. Hi, sweet friends. I'm Mary, and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods, like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. The first thing I want to say is if at any time you want to jump ahead in this video, I'll have detailed timestamps in both the description and in the pinned comment underneath this video. I'll also have a link that'll take you to the full recipe over on my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel. And another thing I want to mention about the timestamps is that whenever I share a recipe for baking with whole grains, I do like to take a little bit of time to talk to the beginner and to talk about phytic acid, why we're soaking flour, and so on and so forth. Uh, so thank you for indulging me, but know that I have the timestamps for you so you can jump ahead where we get right into baking the bread. This is a very easy bread to make, and we're going to be making two loaves of it. And I highly recommend that you make both loaves rather than trying to split this recipe in half because I think you're going to really inhale the first loaf. And secondly, even if you have a lot of the first loaf left over, the second loaf will freeze very well. And I'll give directions on freezing that once we have the bread baked. Now the ingredients to make this bread are very straightforward. The first thing that you're going to need are six cups of a whole grain flour. And I'm gonna talk about the flour in a little more detail in a minute. The next thing you're going to need are approximately six cups of liquid. Now I'm going to be using one cup of buttermilk and probably about five cups of water. If you don't have buttermilk, don't worry about it. You can use kefir or kefir depending on how you say it. You can also use regular milk in which you put a little bit of vinegar or lemon juice. Or if you want to keep this completely dairy free, you can just use water in which you put a little bit of vinegar. Now, if you do decide to use something other than buttermilk today, I will have all of the detailed instructions as to what the proper amount of liquid to vinegar is in the printable recipe over on my website. Now, if you're using buttermilk from the grocery store, you can use the low-fat buttermilk or the full-fat buttermilk. Either one will do. And if you want to know how to make your own real buttermilk from the liquid that's left over when you take cream and culture it and make cultured butter, I have a very detailed video on that and I'll be sure to link to that in the description uh, and in the pinned comment if that's something that you'd like to learn. The only other ingredients that you're going to need are two and a half teaspoons of salt, and I just have a fine ground sea salt here and two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast. This is packaged yeast. If you have the little packages, that's exactly the right amount, two and one quarter teaspoons. If you're measuring it out, just use your measuring spoons if you have a larger package of yeast. Now, can you use active yeast? Yes. Can you use instant yeast? Yes. Either one will do. The only real difference between the two of them is that the instant yeast is slightly more forgiving in terms of the warmth of the temperature of your water. Uh, active yeast can handle up to about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the instant yeast can handle up to about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And instant yeast doesn't need to be proofed. It was invented, if that's the right word, uh, basically to be used in bread machines, but today people or all, with doing all types of baking, we'll use instant yeast. And that's exactly what I have here today, is instant yeast. And the final ingredient is to use three tablespoons of some type of whole sweetener. Now this is optional if you want to keep your bread completely sweet-free. However, whenever you're baking with whole grains, they can tend to be a little more 
bitter than if you're just using all-purpose flour or bread flour where all the bran and the germ have been sifted out of. Often at the grocery store you may see 100% whole wheat described as honey whole wheat and they've added a little sweetener. And that's because it does make the taste of the bread better and more palatable. And we're just going to use three tablespoons, but this is optional and you can leave it out. But what I've got here are three tablespoons of maple syrup. You can certainly use honey if you wish, uh, and it, do, it can just be a very simple pourable honey. It doesn't need to be raw or anything like that because we are going to be heating it. And when it does come to heating honey, I prefer to reserve it for those things that are not heated, but everybody has different opinions on that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and use maple syrup. Uh, you could also use a dry sweetener like Sucanat, or you may know it as Rapadura. It's the unrefined sugar cane, and that is definitely an option. Uh, you could use coconut sugar. Uh, for other liquid sweeteners, you could certainly use coconut syrup. It really is all going to depend where you are on your traditional foods journey, uh, leaving your processed kitchen behind, your processed foods kitchen behind, so to speak, and moving towards a traditional foods kitchen where you're using more whole sweeteners as opposed to white sugar. So most people have honey and certainly you can use that, but if, you've, if you're a little farther on your journey and you have some various alternative sweeteners that you like to use, by all means, anything will work. Now the reason that we're using buttermilk or kefir or kefir or some sort of acidulated milk or water is because we are going to be soaking this flour that we use overnight. And the reason we're soaking this flour, this whole grain flour, in some sort of acidulated medium is because we want to deactivate some of the phytic acid. And why do we want to deactivate some of the phytic acid? And the reason is, is because phytic acid has some anti-nutrient properties. Now phytic acid also has a good side, which we'll talk about in a minute. But let's talk about the anti-nutrient properties first. These anti-nutrients prevent our digestive systems from absorbing all of the nutrition that the grain has to offer. Anti-nutrients also can strip various nutrition out of our digestive system. So we want to deactivate some of those anti-nutrients so that we hold on to the various vitamins and minerals in our food so that we can nourish our bodies. Now, you're not going to be able to deactivate all of the anti-nutrients that phytic acid contains, but that's not a bad thing because, as I mentioned earlier, phytic acid also has a good side. Phytic acid can also serve as an antioxidant, and antioxidants are things that fight against oxidation. And what is oxidation? Oxidation is damage. So on the one hand, we're deactivating some of the phytic acid, which will help us better absorb the nutrients that the wheat has to offer, as well as prevent it stripping too much out of our body, too many other nutrients out of our body. And at the same time, we'll get the benefits of the antioxidants that phytic acid offers so that it can help tamp down oxidation or damage that takes place in our bodies. So when you soak whole grains or whole grain flour in some sort of acidulated liquid for anywhere from say 12 to 24 hours, you start to deactivate some of that phytic acid. So if you like to eat a lot of whole grains or whole grain bread, deactivating some of that phytic acid is a very good step to take. So if you like to eat a lot of whole grains or you like to eat a lot of whole grain baked goods, it's great to learn how to soak your flour and then proceed with using that soaked flour to bake. Now I've already showed you how to make muffins and today we're going to make a yeasted bread. And this is especially helpful if you're not in the habit of keeping a sourdough starter and making sourdough bread, because that process, which involves a soaking, in essence also helps to deactivate phytic acid. 
but I know that keeping a sourdough starter and baking sourdough bread isn't always an option. So simply soaking your flour in acidulated liquid and then using it to proceed to make muffins or a quick bread, or in our case today, a yeasted bread, solves some of that problem. And even if you are in the habit of keeping a sourdough starter and making sourdough bread, learning how to soak whole grain flour can come in very handy when you do want to make muffins or quick breads. Now, when it comes to choosing your whole grain flour, you can use just your average whole wheat flour, modern day whole wheat flour, that's generally ground from hard red wheat berries that you'll find at your grocery store. You can use whole grain spelt flour, einkorn, rye, whatever type of flour, whole grain flour you like to use, you can use this recipe for to bake yeasted bread with. Now, if you have whole grain and you like to grind that in a grain mill, you can definitely use that type of flour as well. Either way will work. And you don't have to be too concerned about the flour to liquid ratio as you do when you're making other types of breads, whether you're using store-bought flour or whether you're using freshly ground flour. And then also slightly more complicated by the fact of what type of flour you're using, whether it's spelt or einkorn or modern day whole wheat and so on and so forth. If that's something that you're interested in learning about, I have a very detailed video where I go over all of the various differences in liquid to flour, depending on what type of flour you're using. And I'll be sure to link to that video below. Now, one thing I want to mention about using whole grain flour, if you've been with me a while, you know that I often will recommend mixing in a little all purpose flour or a little bit of bread flour with your whole grain flour, just to help lighten the loaf. And if you're grinding your grain and creating fresh milled flour, I often recommend sifting out a little bit of the bran and the germ. Now, this is not something that you have to do because you're going to find that the soaking method actually really helps lighten whole grain flour considerably and create a relatively light baked good, which is nice. But if it's something that you do want to consider to maybe really lighten everything up, then that's a good step to take. And really you're looking at no more than maybe a cup of all-purpose or bread flour substituted for one of the cups of the whole grain flour. And when it comes to sifting out some of the bran and the germ, you can kind of just eyeball it and sift out maybe a little less than a quarter or so of the bran and the germ. It's not an exact science. And I never want you to feel bad about doing that because you still have a lot of nutrition left in your bread uh, from the whole grain flour that you are using. And this is a practice that dates back hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe even farther. And it was very common in the Middle Ages uh, where bakers would sift out some of the bran and the germ because they knew that it would create a lighter loaf and a more digestible loaf. But the good news is, as I said, we are gonna be soaking this overnight in an acidulated liquid and that does create a much lighter baked good than you may be familiar with if you tend to bake with whole grain flour, but you're not soaking it. Now I'm gonna grind my whole grain, and what I've got here is whole grain spelt. However, what I've got soaking back there that's been soaking for about 18 hours is just regular whole wheat flour from the grocery store that I've soaked in water and buttermilk. And the reason that I've got that one soaking is because I want to be able to bake for you and show you what a bread looks like if you're just using whole wheat flour from the grocery store, since I know that's the most common. But I did want to show you that you can use your whole grain and grind it into flour and use that flour as well. Now, if you are grinding your whole grain into flour and you're relatively new to this, the general rule is that approximately one cup of whole grain will give you approximately one and a half cups of flour. Now, there are variations because uh, different types of wheat 
uh, are different in size. The ancient grains tend to be a little smaller with einkorn being the smallest. And uh, then you have kamut that's kind of on the larger side. And then you have the more modern day wheats that tend to be larger than say the ancient grains, especially einkorn. So there is a little variation, but that's a general rule. Any extra flour you have that you're not going to use within the next day or two can easily be tucked into your freezer and used when you're ready to bake with it. Now I want to mention, because I get a lot of questions about my grain mill, this is a mock mill and I just have the small one, the mock mill 100. It's perfect uh, for my family size and I've been very happy with it. It's a stone grinding mill so it's very protective uh, of the oils that are naturally occurring in grain. And the folks at Mock Mill are just the best. I purchased this after doing a lot of research, uh, but I've been so happy with it that I contacted them and asked them if they would give a discount code for my viewers, and they were happy to do so. Uh, so if you're ever in the market for a grain mill and you do your research and you decide you want a Mock Mill, uh, be sure to check that code, which I'll put a link to my shopping guide uh, in the description below uh, so that you can take advantage of that. Now, with my mock mill, when I grind my grain fresh uh, into, fl into fresh flour, I like to set it on five because I generally do sift out a little bit of the bran and the germ, not a lot, but just a little bit. And I find that on number five, the flour is fine enough that works for pretty much any type of baking, yet coarse enough that I'm able to easily sift out some of the bran and the germ. Uh, but as you see, it goes from one to 10, so you can make your flour as fine or as coarse as you like. Alrighty, well, let's go ahead and get this started. Well, I've got my spelt all beautifully ground here. Now I just want to take a second to talk to you about the sifters. Now these are more along the lines of the professional baking sifters. And then this is just a fine mesh drainer that you would drain food in. <laughs> this is often what I use. But uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, this uh, is, I believe this one is a 40 and I believe this one is a 50 or a 60. And the number, uh, the higher the number, the tighter the mesh. The f so you're going to sift out more bran and germ. And the lower the number, the looser the mesh. So you're, gonna, you're going to sift out less bran and germ. And these are available uh, pretty much in any kitchen store if that's something that you really want to do where you want to seriously sift out a lot of bran and germ. Uh, to create something close to an all-purpose flour. And I have videos, a uh, number of videos where I show you how to do all of that. And I'll definitely link to those below if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, however, when it comes to doing something like this, where I just want to sift out a little bit of the bran and the germ, I just use a fine mesh kitchen strainer. And I just wanted to mention, in addition to kitchen stores, in case you don't have one near you, uh, online stores like Breadtopia often have these. I do believe that sometimes I've seen these on Amazon, and if I can find some, I will put them in the link in the description below. Uh, but I just want to verify that they are very good quality. Uh, they're not expensive, but uh, the ones sold from companies like Breadtopia or King Arthur Flour, uh, that's where I got, uh, Either these came from Breadtopia or King Arthur Flour, I can't remember. They're very nice quality. And so uh, that's something that if you're interested in, definitely check that out. Now I'm going to measure out my six cups of flour. And probably just for the first cup or two, I'll sift out a little bit of the bran and the germ. Uh, don't worry if you're using store-bought flour and so you're not going through this process, you might wind up having slightly more flour than I'm gonna have with this batch, although, as I said, that one was done in behind me, which is what we're going to bake, was done with store-bought flour. Uh, but if you are grinding your own grain at home and you're gonna sift out a little, uh, don't worry about it not being perfect in terms of the full six cups. 
a lot of this is very flexible because it's going to be dependent on how much liquid we wind up actually adding. And I'm going to show you the exact consistency that you're looking for. Now, alternatively, if you don't want to go through this sifting process, you can just go ahead, use five cups of flour, and then one cup of all-purpose or, or bread flour that you have. And it's okay that you're adding it in either before or after the soak, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, if you ever find you need more flour because your batter is just a little too runny, you just want to use all-purpose or bread flour that's already had the bran and germ sifted out of it so it doesn't need soaking. Uh, but that is something that you can consider. But I just wanted to show you this step so that if this is something that you're interested in doing, uh, you can see what it looks like. And as I go ahead and sift this, and then I get down to the bran and the germ, I'll show you what it looks like. Now, do you discard that? No, definitely don't. Save it for when you're making like a, a bran bread or bran muffins or just using as a coating, so to speak, uh, in your Dutch oven or on your baking stone when you're baking a boule. As you'll see, the fine mesh strainer just takes out a little bit of the bran and the germ and then I'm just going to go ahead and transfer that to a separate little bowl there. So that's one cup of flour. And now, actually, I think what I'll do is I'll use this other sifter so that you can see the difference. And this is the, the less fine mesh. So this would sift out less bran and germ than this tighter mesh would. And again, it's just kind of the same process where you just gently shake this. I always feel like a prospector, like I'm looking for gold. <laughs> but we'll get this flour down, and then I'll show you how much bran and germ is left. Now you'll see you do get a bit more if you use uh, the baker sifter. And this probably would measure out maybe about an eighth of a cup of bran and germ, where this is really, you know, would be measured in teaspoons. And this, again, is just using the mesh strainer that most kitchens have, and this is using the baker sifter. So I just wanted to show you that sifting process so that you could be aware of it, but don't feel any obligation to do that uh, when you're doing a soaked flour bread uh, because the soaking process is going to lighten things up considerably. So that was my third cup of flour, and now I'm going to go ahead and add in my fourth cup of flour. Now, does fresh milled flour measure a little differently than the flour from the store? Yes, all of these things do play a role when you're making a more exacting bread. And that's why I have a very detailed video on how to take all of that into consideration. However, since this is a very forgiving, very easy to make bread, we don't have to worry about it. Well, now I've got my six cups of whole grain spelt flour in my bowl. A little bit of the bran and germ sifted out of it, uh, but that won't matter any in terms of uh, how we uh, soak this and how much liquid we use, because we're looking more not so much for being precise with measurements as we are for a particular texture. And I'll explain as we add more and more liquid. Now, I just want to get my buttermilk in there. If you're not using uh, buttermilk and you're using kefir or kefir, you can go ahead and pour in one cup of that. Uh, if you're not uh, using either of those uh, and you just want to use water, you can uh, go ahead and add a little bit of uh, apple cider vinegar to your water and to acidulate that and then go ahead and add in that first cup to mix in nicely like this. Uh, or if you want to use milk, add a little bit of lemon juice or vinegar, that will work also. And as I mentioned earlier, the recipe over on my website, I'll have all the exact measurements uh, so you can be very secure when you go to actually bake this. Now I'm just going to start, I'm going to pour my water in here just to help rinse out this cup a little and get every little last bit, bit every, little, every little last bit of goodness of the buttermilk. And so this would count as our second cup of liquid. 
So you'll see as you add that second cup of liquid that the dough is starting to become, you know, a little more dense, a little more coming together. But what we're looking for is to achieve something that looks very much like a batter because no knead breads that are baked in loaf pans are basically loosely based on the old fashioned batter breads. Once packaged yeast came into existence and homemakers started using a lot of that, they were often very busy and didn't want to get involved with all the kneading necessary when you're making bread. And they found that if they added a little more liquid and had a little looser dough, they could basically just turn it into a batter and let it rise and then throw it in the pan and get ready to bake it. And life became quite a bit easier. So that is the popularity of making a batter bread. And if you make my sandwich bread that I know you have told me that you've been very happy with, uh, that is also based on a batter bread recipe. So that's why we're going to be, that's why what's more important here in terms of uh, trying to be exact in terms of measurement for liquid because every kitchen is different, the weather outside is different. It's going to be more looking for the proper batter texture and that's what I'm going to show you. So now we'll go ahead and add our third cup of liquid, in my case water, <laughs> and we'll go ahead and mix this in. And little by little, the more water you add, you're going to find this becoming closer and closer to a batter. So you'll see this is getting more and more moist, more looking like a batter after each addition. Now let's put in our fourth cup. Now I'm just going to work this in until the flour absorbs all of this water and we'll see how the batter looks. Now we are going to hold back a little bit on the liquid. We're not going to put in the full six cups. And again, you know, this is approximately six cups. We're going to just watch this until we get the right consistency. And don't worry, I'm going to show you that because we want to have a little wiggle room for the next day after we've let this soak uh, to add uh, the water that will contain our yeast. Well, this is coming along very nicely. Now, I don't want you to worry if it looks all lumpy and whatnot. All of that will dissipate uh, during the soaking process. And, but this is coming along very nicely. We want it a little looser than this for the overnight soak because all of that whole grain, whatever type of whole grain you're using, is going to really absorb this liquid. So let's go ahead. Let me see if I have enough here. If not, I'll go get some more water. I do like to use some type of filtered water when doing this only because the chlorinated water, whenever you're soaking anything, it's also the same with making sourdough or making ferments. The simpler the water, so to speak, the less chemicals it has in it, the better the whole soaking process or fermentation process will go because the chemicals tend to impair the soaking process and either the fermentation or the deactivation of the phytic acid and so on and so forth. Having a more pure water is always more beneficial. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and add my fifth cup. And I know from experience that that's going to look perfect, but I'll mix it up and I'm gonna show you and we'll hold off on the six cup because that's what we'll add tomorrow. So this is the exact batter texture that we're looking for. And you might be saying, wow, that looks really watery, but you gotta trust me on this. It's gonna be absolutely fine. To begin with, it's gonna be about the six cups of flour and about five cups of water. And that should get you pretty darn close to the exact texture that you're looking for uh, before you put this, in essence, to bed to soak overnight. Now, all you need to do is cover your batter with some plastic wrap and put this either on your counter or in the refrigerator, wherever you're most comfortable leaving it to soak. 
and you can leave it to soak anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. The longer soak will create the lightest baked good. Well, I'm gonna put this aside now and I'm gonna get the one that I made last night. Well, here is our flour that's soaked overnight. This is soaked probably by now for about 18 hours. Now, as you'll see, the change in consistency is pretty significant. It's much more stringy <laughs> and dough-like as opposed to watery. So this is exactly what it'll look like. And it's actually quite similar. There isn't a lot of variation. Uh, whether you go the 12 or 24 hours, uh, it's pretty similar. And so, but this is what you're going to find after that soak of the six cups of flour and the five cups of liquid. Now what I've got here is a half a cup of warm water. And I'm going to add to that my maple syrup. And then I'm going to go ahead and add in my yeast. And I'm just going to give that a little bit of a mix. Now I'm going to go ahead and add our mixture right into our batter. You just want to keep mixing in your yeast mixture until your dough returns back to that batter appearance. There we go. This is looking really good. You just want to make sure that that's really mixed in well. Alrighty, now we've got that yeast mixed in very nicely. Now we'll go ahead and sprinkle in our salt and then mix that in. And that's our last step before we cover this and let it rise. Well, I've got the salt mixed in. Our batter looks perfect. What we're gonna do now is cover this with plastic wrap, or if you wanna use a flour sack towel or dish towel, just dust it with a little flour so that nothing sticks. And we're going to let this rest for an hour and a half, just on your kitchen counter is fine. We're gonna let this rest for an hour and a half uh, if we use the instant yeast, which I used, or if you've used the active dry yeast, you'll probably wanna let this rest for an hour and three quarters or an hour and 45 minutes. Well, I let this rest for an hour and a half. Now I'm just gonna gently mix this a little bit just to get it down from the sides and get everything moved definitely into the center. And you'll see it's got a wonderful consistency, but very batter-like, very much like a batter, like we're gonna make a cake. Next, you're gonna need two nine by five loaf pans, and in each you wanna put maybe about a tablespoon of butter. I'm not really measuring it, but we need a fairly good amount because we have to grease these really well. Now, if you're trying to keep it dairy-free, you could use coconut oil or any type of uh, other oil that you want that is, what would you say, uh, has a smoke point of 350. Uh, or lower because we're going to bake these breads at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So just really give your loaf pans a really good greasing up. And don't worry if you have like a little bit of chunks of butter in places. I'll show you what mine looks like when I'm done. It doesn't matter, you, but you just want to make sure that everything is very well greased, as you'll see. That is a really well greased loaf pan. Now all we're going to do is divide the batter equally between these two loaf pans. Alrighty, let's we'll pour a little bit in here, kind of like when we're doing a cake. Now I'm just going to pour in this second to this second pan. I'm trying to eyeball it best I can. Okay, I think we're going to need going to go back and forth a little, get a little more over here, and then I'll just keep going back and forth, eyeballing it until I think it looks correct, or I should say even, equal to one another. Now we're just going to let these rest, and we're going to preheat our oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now my oven just beeped and came up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So we'll just let that stay at that temperature nice and warm. And I just wanna take a minute to talk about uh, our batter breads 
at this stage in their loaf pans. Now I did get a little more batter in this one than this one, but it won't matter. <laughs> in any event, uh, the reason that we did not cover these while we were waiting for our oven to come up to temp was because it's very important that we don't let these batter breads rise any higher than the rim of these loaf pans. If they were to rise up higher than these loaf pans, the way a traditional bread dough may rise up and kind of dome up nicely is because if you let that happen, first of all, with a batter bread, it's, very, it's a very loose batter and it may just wind up pouring over. But also, even if it were to rise up and maybe even make a little bit of a dome, in this particular recipe where we've soaked the bread, soaked the bread, soaked the flour overnight, what can happen is that your bread can be very dense. So to keep your bread light, you just want to make sure that it doesn't rise past the rim of your loaf pan. Well, these look great, so I'm going to go ahead and pop them into the oven. Middle rack, 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, I had these loaves in my oven for approximately 40 minutes at 350 degrees Fahrenheit on the middle rack. Now, at 30 minutes, I started keeping an eye on them because I wanted to make sure that they weren't over browning. I have a very small oven, and so I've got to kind of be careful that my breads don't over brown. And if they were over browning, then I was just going to tent them with foil but they were doing just fine. And so I let them go, uh, that was at 30 minutes, I let them go the additional 10 minutes to finish baking, and I think they look glorious. So plan to bake these for 40 minutes, but keep an eye on them at the 30 minute mark, just to make sure that they're not over browning on top. Now I wanna mention one extra step that you can do at this point if you like a bread that has a very soft crust. If you do, then take a small piece of butter and just rub it across the top. You can also sprinkle it with a little sea salt if you want. But just taking a small piece of butter like this, rubbing it across the top, take the other piece, rub it across the, the top of the other bread, that will make the, the top crust be very soft. I'm not going to rub the butter on top because I like to have a little bit of a bite or a little bit of a crunch to the top of the bread. Now these are warm but I'm going to take them out because once you find that you know using pot holders or whatever the case may be uh, that you're able to handle these uh, then you want to go ahead and get them onto a cooling rack and you'll see these just baked up beautifully and I don't if this will come across on the mic or not, but the way that you can tell that your bread is baked is when you tap on the bottom. Can you hear that? Almost sounds like a hollow drum. That's the sound that you're looking for. And you know that it's baked inside. Now the secret to these breads, and I know this is tough, but you do need to let these cool. They don't have to get cold. You can enjoy them slightly warm, but you don't want to slice them when they're this hot. So we're going to let these cool and then we will slice into them and I'll show you how the crumb looks. Well, this has cooled off a bit, still a little on the warm side, but let's go ahead and slice into it. I think it's going to be glorious. Oh, listen to that. Oh, look at this beautiful bread. Well, I am just so pleased with how beautiful this bread is. And I'll bring you in for some close-up pictures so you can see all the wonderful nooks and crannies, not the least bit dense. And if you've ever had like English toasting bread or English muffin bread, you're gonna love this because this is basically a whole wheat version that's also been soaked so it should be more digestible as well. So you can eat this as is or toast it any way that you like. Now, I think what we need to do is give this a taste with a little bit of butter 
and see what we think of this. Oh, I think it's going to be glorious. <laughs> this butter is nice and soft. Yeah, all those. Oh, I just love the nooks and crannies. I can't wait to try a toasted too. Let me try this end with the with the uh, top crust. Mmm. 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 This bread is so delicious, and the soaking, along with a little bit of sweetener, just gives it such a lovely flavor. Well, now, if you'd like to learn how to make more breads, yeasted breads, soaked breads, quick breads, sourdough, cookies, everything, be sure to click on this video over here, where I have a full playlist that covers all that and more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.